thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon um, to hear from Kevin Trenberth. It's a real honor to have him join us as part of this climate science symposium. Um, a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit about Kevin, about his academic background, but I'll tell you a little bit about sort of his um, current, um, uh, how he's been portrayed currently in the media recently. Uh, so Kevin um, is a native of New Zealand and did his undergraduate degree um, at the University of Canterbury and followed by a doctorate at MIT. Um, after that, he, um, he has spent some time with the New Zealand Meteorological Service. He was faculty at the University of Illinois and then most recently for the past almost 30 years, it sounds like. 26. 26 years at the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, in Colorado, which is fairly well insulated from um, the politics of climate change, but uh, that notwithstanding, Kevin has taken a, a leadership role in the IPCC report that is written. He's been a co-lead author of that since, uh, well, he's been involved since 1990, and most recently he was the lead author on the last assessment. Um, Kevin is a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and has won an unbelievable number of awards, which I'm not going to rattle off here today because it would take up all of the time, um, and has uh, over, over 400 publications to his name. Uh, he's an incredibly well-respected scientist across the board as being extremely fair and even-handed with what are often considered very controversial data. And perhaps he is most recently um, known for being involved in the now infamous um, debacle with stolen emails from the University of East Anglia, um, <clears throat> whereby climate skeptics uh, self-servingly used sentences taken out of context to foster skepticism among the global public. And as someone who um, works on topics that most of the, so most of the time seem uh, very insignificant to the public and at arm's length from media distortion, um, I stand in awe of the candor and poise that Dr. Trenberth has exhibited through all of this. Um, and coming under fire from climate skeptic groups and those who seek really not to contribute to our understanding of these issues, but merely to derail our progress as a scientific community. Um, so through all of this, I, I feel that Dr. Trenberth has resoundingly stood by his statements and in my estimation, with his integrity fully intact, um, and continuously made the case for openness of data and methods, and refocused all of this fervor that the media distortion has sort of generated back on the scientific issues at hand. And so please join me in welcoming Kevin Trenberth to our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. I have done a lot on climate change, and I'm not an oceanographer. I'm a meteorologist, but I was asked to speak here about the role of the ocean in climate. And so you'll get uh, maybe a, a distorted view of this, and I'm afraid I'm going to talk mainly about the physical climate system and not about the uh, uh, ecology uh, aspects uh, so much. Um, to, to set the stage, we'll talk about uh, the role of the different components of the climate system. And so this is just a picture from space uh, showing uh, patches of ice, uh, the land, of course, and uh, uh, the atmosphere, weather systems, and then uh, the ocean are making up uh, some 70% of the globe. And so uh, just to briefly summarize the role of the different components of the climate system, uh, the role of the atmosphere, you know, this is the most volatile component of the climate system. We have winds that can easily exceed uh, 200 miles per hour. Uh, it, the winds move energy around, but the, the, uh, the, the atmosphere is very thin. This is actually the NCAR logo here, and it's looking at the Earth sideways on, and the, and the atmosphere is a very, very thin layer. It, it amounts to about one four hundredth of the radius of the Earth. And so when you look at the Earth from space, it looks like the clouds are right on the surface of the Earth. And that actually enables you to make certain kinds of approximations that work very well in terms of modeling the, the whole system. But the atmosphere does not have very much heat capacity. All of the weather occurs mainly in the lowest uh, 10 kilometers in, in the extratropics and 16 kilometers in the tropics, the so-called troposphere, the lowest part, and uh, they move energy around. And so uh, this, this is a very important role for the atmosphere. The role of the oceans, uh, that certainly covers most of the world, and uh, oceanographers don't like it when I say this, but the main, most important thing about the ocean is that it's wet. 
Uh, this gives rise to water vapor, which then goes into the atmosphere, forms clouds, uh, rainfall, the overall hydrological cycle, and that's actually its most important component in the overall climate system. But the ocean also has a large heat capacity, and the atmosphere is equivalent to only about 3.5 meters of the ocean in terms of the total heat capacity, which relates to the specific heat of the, of the substance and the mass of the, of the system. Now, the oceans adjust very slowly to uh, changes, and if the uh, ocean, or well, the ocean is well mixed to somewhere between about 20 meters in summer to about 100 meters in winter, and, and uh, if uh, you take some kind of an overall average of about 90 meters and mix it instantaneously and have a response, an abrupt, respo uh, an abrupt forcing of the system, then the ocean uh, would, this is actually an, so what is called an e-folding time, for those of you who know what that is, uh, an exponential response time of about six years uh, would occur. But if you take the total ocean, the mean depth of about 3,800 meters, if it responded instantaneously, which means the mixing has to occur instantaneously, and it doesn't, uh, that would delay things by 230 years. And so the ocean is not in equilibrium with the climate. And the bottom part of the ocean is running about a thousand years behind what actually happened at the surface. The overall delay is somewhere around, uh, if you want to put a single number on about 20 years, uh, 10 years in the tropics, 100 years uh, in some other places. And uh, the ocean also is dynamic. It moves things around. And so we have a schematic, the so-called Great Ocean Conveyor, showing the uh, sort of the Gulf Stream and the return flow, which tends to be on, in so-called western boundary currents, uh, moving water around over the ocean, uh, some places where it's relatively shallow, uh, and then the uh, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The role of land, uh, very briefly, you know, the heat penetration into land with the annual cycle is only about two meters. And so the mass of land that's involved in the climate system tends to be a lot less. The specific heat of land is also four and a half, a factor of four and a half less than seawater. And so for moist soil, this might be maybe a factor of two. And so the heat capacity of land is a lot less than for the oceans. However, land has a great deal of variety and uh, heterogeneity. And uh, so these other points here relate to that. And the main variations of land that are really important for climate is the variations in soil moisture, the, the water that's available on land, and how that gets into the atmosphere, uh, sometimes through evapotranspiration, through the pumping of water through the roots of plants into the leaves as a part of the photosynthesis process and transpiration. Uh, and so also uh, vegetation, of course, changes and the, the roughness uh, varies uh, also spatially. The role of ice, uh, you had a, a seminar on this a week ago, I understand, and so I'm not gonna say very much about it. Uh, the, the major ice sheets, the main uh, way in which heat uh, penetrates is through conduction, so it's a fairly slow process, but ice actually melts, and so this changes sea level on, on long time scales. The ice volumes are given here, and uh, this, this, is, this depends a little bit on assumptions, but uh, these are sort of estimates as to how much the sea level would rise if you melted Greenland or Antarctica as a whole or, or just the uh, ice caps. There's a big difference between ice in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, although that's uh, changing in the Arctic. The ice is actually getting thinner and there's less uh, multi-year ice uh, over time. But ice is very bright, it reflects the solar radiation, there's an ice albedo feedback process, and uh, as a result, there's a positive feedback in response to changes in ice. Uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet is partly grounded below sea level, and uh, water, uh, warming could alter the grounding of the ice sheet, making it float and vulnerable to rapid uh, disintegration, but even that would still take uh, centuries, and that could also result in a, a rise in sea level of about four to six meters. Uh, at the moment, the biggest uh, contribution from the ice sheets is coming from Greenland. Uh, some of these changes are probably irreversible. I just put in uh, one slide here relating to El Nino, which is uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. The scientists refer to it often by this acronym called ENSO. And this relates to coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. It would not occur 
as an atmospheric phenomenon or an ocean phenomenon alone. And so it's actually when the, um, when the two things are, are going together, uh, El Nino refers to the warm phase and La Nina refers to the cold phase. And in fact, uh, I could give a whole seminar on El Nino and I haven't uh, got very much on, it, on this, but I will say a little bit more about it uh, later on. And uh, El Nino uh, is very important for marine ecology along the California coast and, uh, and British Columbia. I'm going to talk quite a lot about energy on Earth, and this relates to the climate change issue. So we have uh, over far on the right-hand side here the sun. The sun's rays are coming in. They're more or less parallel at that point. And so the geometry of the rotation of the Earth relative to the sun is a key, uh, a key part of the overall distribution of the incoming radiant energy. There's more in the tropics than there is at high latitudes. And the Earth is rotating, of course, so uh, you get solar radiation during the day but not at night. And uh, then there's uh, different land masses which affect the overall uh, temperature gradients and affect things like the jet stream, which, has, which is more east-west uh, in the southern hemisphere and there's more waves in the northern hemisphere. The net result of all of this is that the net radiation has a profile like this, uh, more in the tropics than at high latitudes, and the way in which the energy budget is balanced is through the movement of heat and energy from the lower latitudes to the high latitudes by the atmosphere and the ocean. And fundamentally, this drives uh, the weather and climate systems. And so we have uh, a tremendous amount of variety in the form that energy can take. We have internal energy, which is related to temperature. We have potential energy, which is related to gravity and how high the atmosphere or the ocean is above some datum point. Latent energy, which relates to a phase changes uh, from ice to water to vapor and so on, and kinetic energy, which relates to the movement. And the richness of these different kinds of energy, especially in the atmosphere, some of these are not as evident uh, in the ocean, in particular the latent energy, um, gives rise to tremendous amounts of different phenomena in the way in which heat and energy can be moved around in order to satisfy the overall constraints of uh, the uh, uh, forcing of the climate system by the radiation and the radiation back to space as infrared radiation. Now, under an equilibrium climate, there would be a balance between the incoming and outgoing radiation. And this is what actually drives the weather systems in the atmosphere and also uh, contributes to the currents in the ocean. A lot of that comes about from the winds driving the ocean currents as well. And of course, they can change. And so we'll talk about that. I'm going to give you a, there's a few little equations here, but this is just a schematic to indicate the framework I'm going to deal with. I'm going to mostly talk about the atmosphere as a single layer and the ocean as a single layer. And so there's radiation at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface. There's a sensible heat flux into the atmosphere and there's a latent energy flux. This is moisture going into the atmosphere, which then gets rained out in terms of the form of precipitation. Uh, FA refers to the flux of energy in the atmosphere, and so that this is a divergence of that quantity, so it, it, it balances these other terms, and also in the ocean. Uh, here I've ignored the changes over time, but there's some simple expressions you can write down. FS is the total surface flux. That's what that refers to, and my sign convention is that it's into the atmosphere, and it's just the sum of these three components uh, that's given up here. Often we also refer to this thing called Q1, which is the net diabatic heating in the atmosphere, the net heating in the atmosphere, which relates to the top of the atmosphere and the surface. And we can write it this way as the difference between E and P uh, locally. On a global basis, that term is pretty well zero. And uh, Q2 is related to the moistening of the atmosphere. That's this, this term here. So I'll show you some of these uh, terms in the course of the, uh, the rest of the lecture. So at the top of the atmosphere, uh, the, uh, what I'm going to show you is a, a movie. This is uh, January 1st. We can see most of the radiation that's coming into the planet. This is the net radiation is down here in the uh, southern hemisphere uh, in the subtropics. And then let's see if we can uh, click this and watch the movie and you'll see it evolve over time. Notice uh, places like the Sahara actually have a deficit. They're very bright. They reflect a lot of radiation back to space. You can see signatures of clouds 
in here, low-level clouds that are bright. But generally, a lot of this is simply following the sun back and forwards across the equator. We'll get a different view of this uh, a little bit later. Uh, this is uh, the net radiation, and you'll see uh, that it's uh, focused pretty close to the equator overall, but it's not uniform around the latitude circles. So there's less over here, and that relates to low cloud. And if you live up here, you'll know that there's fog and, and stratus cloud that is relatively bright, and that occurs in the southern hemisphere, most strongly here than anywhere else around the world. And that contributes to uh, uh, less radiation as a whole there. The Sahara is a deficit region. It's very hot during the day. It radiates to space, but it reflects a lot of radiation. And in fact, the only way it can maintain its energy balance is by a transfer of heat into the region through subsiding air. This is the uh, net atmospheric heating, what we call the diabatic heating in the atmosphere, which is one of the things I had on that previous slide. And uh, this, is, this is rather different than the net radiation. This is important then for weather. In the subtropics, a lot of this relates to the moistening of the atmosphere, the evaporation of moisture that's going into the atmosphere. And you can see large differences between land and, and ocean, for instance. And uh, the main difference between these is then due to ocean transports over the ocean, over the land. These actually should be the same, although the the um, contour intervals are not the same. So the net surface flux, in other words, the net energy that's going into the ocean. Yes? The variation with latitude is actually pretty close to what you'd expect from the geometry, it turns out. There's a small effect from changes in clouds, but it's very much secondary. So on an annual basis, uh, it pretty much matches what you might expect naively from the geometry, just the cosine of the latitude factor. Uh, this is perhaps a bit noisy, and it's a bit of an old slide now, uh, but this is the, a computation of the an annual uh, net flux into the ocean out of the ocean, should I say, large here off of in the Kurashio region and also in the Gulf Stream region. This is where cold, dry air coming off of the continents over a relatively warm ocean produces very large uh, fluxes of energy into the atmosphere, uh, more so than anywhere else around the world. And so there's a great deal of difference. Uh, the ocean is far from uniform in that regard and very different on the eastern side of the ocean, for instance. Probably it's better to look at this, which is showing the, uh, the departures from that in terms of June, July, August, and December, January, February. So in, the, uh, in June, July, August, the heat is coming out of the ocean, and in the northern hemisphere, it's going into the ocean, and the reverse is true in December, January, February. Tremendous amounts of heat coming out of the ocean, and if you live near the ocean, of course, there is a a moderating effect of that. Uh, if you live further in the interior of continents, you have a continental climate and you lose that moderating effect. And so uh, the oceans uh, play a, a key role in, in terms of the annual cycle in this regard. What I'm going to do then is show a brief movie of this. Uh, the net surface flux uh, coming out of the ocean and you'll see it mostly follows the sun but with uh, some, uh, some structure, and especially the structure in the northern hemisphere associated with the boundary currents and the fact that the, the, the general flow of weather systems is from, from uh, west to east, and so you have uh, cold outbreaks, cold dry outbreaks in wintertime over those regions, uh, causing large differences between the east and western sides of the ocean. Whoops, it's going again. Next. Uh, this, this one here now, I'm putting two things together. There's a small panel up here which shows the radiation at the top of the atmosphere, which just shows you the effect of the sun. And then what I'm going to show you is the actual change in the energy heat content uh, in the ocean that we have uh, deduced from this. And 
Um, and these will run also as a movie, and I'll, maybe I'll run this twice. And so you'll see the sun in the northern hemisphere uh, all going into the ocean, and, and the ocean responds, and then it cools off, and then the southern hemisphere warms up uh, in December, and so the heat's going into the ocean in the southern hemisphere here. When I run it the second time around, I want you to look at the tropics uh, in this region here, and you'll see that there's almost no relationship with what's going on at the top of the atmosphere in terms of the radiation. Um, rather com complex structures uh, in, in the tropics. Some of these are related to onsets and decay of monsoons. Uh, in the tropical Pacific, we have a, things like El Nino events. There's a strong structure associated with the tropical convergence zones and, and related things. But the key thing here is that, uh, that it's entirely dominated by dynamics. And in the tropics, the ocean dynamics are much more responsive than they are at higher latitudes, and that relates a lot to the, effect, whoops, the effects of the, the radiation uh, on, the, on the planet, uh, rotation of, of the Earth uh, on the planet. Uh, so for the ocean only, this is the net at the top of the atmosphere on, a, on an annual cycle basis, December through July, th back to January. And so you'll see it in the southern hemisphere here, into the northern hemisphere, into the southern hemisphere. The Earth is closer to the uh, sun in, in January, uh, so there's a small difference in this. And then these deficits at higher latitudes. Now, on the right-hand side, what I've done is to take the annual average out and just look at the departures from the annual average. And so you can see they're quite large. And then down the bottom here, I've got this term called the divergence of the atmospheric energy uh, transports. And so there is strong divergence out of the tropics, in both hemispheres, tropics and subtropics, and convergence into higher latitudes. So this is the atmosphere in action, the, the, the warm air moving polewards in uh, warm sectors of cyclones, the cold air behind, and that moves cold air from here into the tropics and warm air to higher latitudes, very fundamental, and so the main storm tracks are in middle latitudes through here, and, and that's what it does. In the southern hemisphere, you'll see it's a bit more uniform, so when we look at the departures from the annual average, we see a reasonable, reasonably striking pattern in the northern hemisphere, which is somewhere at the order of, uh, I don't know, 30 watts per meter squared. But in the southern, well, no, actually, it's not watts per meter squared. These are uh, integrated so that, well, don't worry about the units. But um, <laughs> uh, in the southern hemisphere, there's very little structure. Uh, it, it's just continually going from low latitudes to high latitudes in the southern hemisphere, but in the northern hemisphere, there's a strong uh, ocean to land component is what this boils down to. Uh, so on an annual basis, maybe we should start with this panel at the bottom right here. At the top of the atmosphere from satellites, we can measure the total transport that's required in order to offset the overall uh, radiative imbalance that's measured at the top of the atmosphere from satellites. So this is entirely a satellite measurement. There's a little bit of variability in here that's given by the, the dash curve. So this is the transport that is required from radiation. And then from the atmospheric measurements, we have this estimate as to how much the atmosphere does in terms of that. And then the ocean is computed as a residual. This is the leftover component and the variability is also given here. And so the atmosphere dominates the polewood heat transport. And it's mainly, as I said before, through the warm air moving polewoods in, in cyclones uh, in, the, in the warm sector behind a warm front, and then the cold air coming down uh, behind it. And then the ocean is predominant in low latitudes. So this is what it looks like then as a function of the annual cycle. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the total transport is polewoods year round. It's a little bit more uniform in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, it's mainly in the, in the wintertime. In the summertime, much less so because uh, the northern hemisphere continents are at high latitudes and they receive sun directly. Uh, this is the atmospheric component. So this is the actual transport within the atmosphere. And then this is the leftover part. This is the ocean component. And it sort of makes sense. Uh, it's mainly during sort of the six months in the winter time when the ocean is, is active and transporting heat northwards and in the six months of the southern hemisphere winter when it's moving heat uh, polewards into the southern hemisphere. 
And you'll see that the main action is indeed in this region in the tropics, which is where, in other words, the ocean currents are playing a key role in the overall climate system. So now I want to talk about the uh, changing climate. And I have uh, this figure of, of ours, which was published in uh, 2009, dealing with the overall energy flows through the climate system in, in this uh, mostly somewhat uh, two-dimensional view of the world. And so we have the energy coming in at the top of the atmosphere. This is uh, largely dictated by the geometry. It's one quarter of the total solar radiance coming into the planet. Uh, and then we have the reflected radiation from the surface. This is going into the surface. Most of it goes through to the surface. Some of it gets absorbed in the atmosphere. And then this has to get out at the surface. Most of the radiation at the surface is initially radiated a lot, but there's a tremendous amount of back radiation or downwelling radiation, and the difference between these is only 63 units. And the largest cooling at the surface that modifies this comes from evapotranspiration. In other words, evaporative cooling, something which is not realized frequently. And so the hydrological cycle plays a major role in moving heat from the surface into the atmosphere where it can radiate to space. Now, one of the things I want to focus on here is let's have a look at these to an extra decimal point and add them up, and we end up with 0.9 watts per meter squared. This is the estimate that we have for the early 2000s as to what the radiative imbalance at the top of the atmosphere is. So this is due to the buildup of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and this is what produces global warming. Now, you can look at this in different, from different perspectives. The overall flow through the system, the difference between this and this, is about you know, 240, uh, 239, and this is sort of one part in 239, if you like to think of it that way. Now, this is, of course, the net result the actual uh, heating that comes from increased carbon dioxide is about estimated 1.6 watts per meter squared, and other greenhouse gases actually boost that up to 3 watts per meter squared. And so what happens, of course, is there's more evaporation, there's more evaporative cooling, there's more radiation to space. And so the system is already responding to offset that, and this is the residual. This is the leftover part. But that means this part is going into the ocean and other parts of the climate system, melting glaciers melting ice on land and, and producing warming of the overall planet. So, uh, and so in terms of the total effect, it's more like, uh, you know, three, uh, it's a little over 1%, really. And this is what's left over. So don't be misled by how small that number actually appears to be. We can also look at it on the basis of ocean versus land. And here, Rather than dealing with it in terms of watts per meter squared, which is what meteorologists and oceanographers often tend to deal with, I've integrated over the area of the ocean and the land so that we can actually look at the flow from one to the other. And so these are actually dealing with what are called petawatts. A peta is uh, 10 to the 15, uh, a one with 15 zeros after it in terms of watts. And so uh, the imbalance at the top of the atmosphere is about half a petawatt. Most of that goes into the ocean. Uh, it's smaller than 0.5. This is around about 0.01 or something like that that's going into the land and melting land ice. It's a relatively a small component. But what this shows is that on average, there is a net flow of energy from the ocean domain to the land domain of about 2.2 petawatts. And in, summer, uh, in the northern hemisphere winter, that number is around about five to six petawatts. So there's a lot of heat coming out of the ocean, going on to land, and then it's radiated to space on land. It's a relatively rapid response. And so the climate would be very different if the ocean were not playing this role. This is the uh, overall changes in temperature with time uh, through 2010. This is actually the uh, NOAA uh, version of this. And uh, I've got a uh, carbon dioxide, uh, annual values of carbon dioxide on here based upon uh, measurements from ice cores. And after 1957, this is the Mauna Loa record on, on here. The scale is given here. And in this case, the uh, zero refers to the values for the uh, 20th century. 
and uh, and I put them together like this to suggest that there's a relationship between them because we think there actually is. In, in particular, this warming after about 1970 is related to the increases in the greenhouse gases and more than half of the carbon dioxide that's gone into the atmosphere has occurred since 1970. So global sea surface temperatures are also increasing. This is not quite up to date. It's around about uh, 0.6 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, and we can look at that on an ocean basis. Uh, so here now we're looking at a function of latitude and time. Uh, firstly, for the Atlantic, uh, where the observations are probably better than in other domains. Uh, and you can see that in the Atlantic, there's a lot of stuff goes on at high latitudes, um, extending even up into the Arctic and the high parts of the uh, the high latitude parts of the uh, Atlantic. Um, and sometimes uh, there is this strong gradient across the Atlantic. And this relates to a phenomenon known as the thermohaline circulation, sometimes referred to as the meridional overturning circulation in the Atlantic. When we look at the Indian Ocean, we see um, also a little bit of warming in here, uh, but more uniform warming. There's less... Uh, variability in the ocean as a part of ocean phenomenology uh, in the Indian Ocean. If we look at the Pacific Ocean, again, we're losing a lot of data as we go back in time, but in the Pacific Ocean, maybe you can see that the maximum variability is actually in the tropics. And you can see that here and also here. And then, in fact, it tends to lead what happens at higher latitudes. And so this relates to the El Nino phenomenon and so and it also relates to the, what is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And so here, uh, it's rather different as to where most of the action is occurring, and we know the phenomena that's associated with that, and also vers uh, versus the Atlantic and versus the Indian Ocean. These three oceans are very different than one another. And the thermohaline circulation relates to, thermo refers to temperature, haline refers to salt. And so these things affect the salinity, affect the density of the ocean, and they affect the overall currents and this overturning circulation within the ocean. And the overturning circulation moves heat around. And so if there's too much heat in one part of the ocean, the ocean circulation can respond and move that heat from the hot spot to the cold spot. And it tends to do so in the, in the Atlantic, in, in that mode. In the Pacific there tends to be a buildup of heat associated with, El, uh, with La Nina. And then the ocean sort of says, oh, I can't stand all this heat. I'm going to have an El Nino. And it moves the heat across the ocean into higher latitudes and through evaporative processes into the atmosphere. And there's a mini global warming following an El Nino event. And so El Nino is a way of the Pacific cooling itself off, regulating itself. There's no such, a, no such phenomenology in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean does this to some extent on an annual basis in association with the onset of monsoons, but not from year to year as much. And so global warming is more readily manifested in the Indian Ocean than in the other two oceans. But as a result, these three oceans are all warming at somewhat different rates to one another. And this is causing some changes in the atmospheric circulation as a result of the communication between the atmosphere and the ocean around the world. So this is what this uh, slide here more or less says. It has an imprint on the global. Whoops! It has an imprint on the global weather patterns, and uh, and this is something which is a challenge for climate models to to simulate correctly. And part of it, as you can see, is also going to be related to where you start off from, because the ocean has these slow components, and so if you don't start off the ocean. In the, in the same state that the, that the true climate system was in, then there's no hope of actually getting to that state. Um, so what about the, ocean, the heat that's going into the ocean and, and what does that do with regard to sea level? Uh, you know, so I've got this number here, 0.9 watts per meter squared. Where does this heat actually go? Well, the comment is that the main heat is the ocean and it's referred to as uh, thermosteric uh, sea level rise. It relates to the temperature increase that gives an expansion of the ocean. Uh, it does melt uh, some sea ice, but that doesn't contribute to a change in sea level. And it also melts land ice, which includes 
the major ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, and, and glaciers. Now, it turns out if you want to raise sea level, the most effective way is to take that heat and melt, melt land ice, not put it in the ocean and expand the ocean. And the gain factor is somewhere around a factor of 30 to 90. If you want an overall number, it's somewhere around a factor of 50. So, uh, so it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between ocean heat content and sea level. So this relates to balancing the overall energy balance. Uh, this is from the IPCC in 2007. Uh, it's a general view as to what has happened in the ocean from the 1950s and 60s to the 1990s to 2000 or 2005 uh, up till that point. And in general, it was warmer and uh, more saline. There's a little scale down here relating to the freshening and the salinity uh, in the tropics and subtropics. And it was fresher uh, at higher latitudes. Uh, and this relates to changes then in evaporation and precipitation, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Uh, notice that underneath this fresher and warmer layer here, there is also a, a layer which is uh, a lot fresher underneath. And this relates to the atmospheric, uh, the ocean circulation uh, along constant density surfaces, which are called isopycnals. So the, the, the freshening that occurs here actually come from water, which is transported from higher latitudes uh, into that region. Now, in the IPCC report also, uh, there was an estimate of the overall energy uh, change uh, from uh, different uh, parts of the, the system. And so the, uh, the total is down the bottom here. The ocean contribution is here. And there are two time frames here. This is total energy, not per year or anything like that. From 1961 to 2003 is the blue bars. And from 1993 to 2003 is the burgundy bars. 1993 is a key time because in 1992, late 1992, we launched a satellite called Topex, which had Topex Poseidon instruments on it that had uh, altimetry that gave us for the first time an accurate view as to what sea level was doing uh, over the ocean. And so we've got much better estimates as to what's going on after that time. And so you'll see that 90% of the warming is in the ocean. There's very small amounts that have gone into melting uh, the, the different ice. Some of it's gone into uh, warming up land, a little bit in the atmosphere. And, uh, and so these are all very small. And so this is where this uh, factor of 50 comes in, for instance. Now, one of the problems in the ocean is the fragmentary nature of some of the data. And there were uh, transects of the North Atlantic Ocean in these years here uh, indicating how much energy was moving polewards in the North Atlantic uh, at these times from a ship sailing across the ocean, making measurements of uh, temperature and salinity and uh, uh, and, and making estimates of, of ocean currents. And, and these were what the estimates were. And when you put them together, you can see, well, it looks like the lowest value was in 2004, and, and maybe there was a, a downward trend in these numbers. But when, uh, in 2004, for the first time, they instrumented the North Atlantic, they found out that the variability in the ocean was much, much greater than they had ever expected. And the magnitude of the variability was, is given by the green curve on here. And so all of these values could just be that you're picking off values at an individual point along here. And it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the changes over that period of time. And so the variability in the ocean is one of the things which is now uh, has to be factored into uh, the, uh, the, the oceanographer's uh, considerations, much, much more so than uh, not too long ago. Now, in the IPCC report in, in 2007, this was one of the figures that was produced showing the overall change in the ocean heat content. Um, there was, this is the Levitus World Ocean Atlas data. This is the NOAA uh, group's value and, uh, and some uncertainty bars. Uh, there's a uh, couple of other data sets that are mentioned on here. And there was this big bump in here 
and then up here, and then there was a decrease right at the end. And this was uh, a particular problem in assessing what has gone on as to what was the cause of this big jump in here and then a decline, and what's the cause of this uh, decline here. And there were all kinds of discussions that occurred in the IPCC report related to this, and it turns out these are both uh, data artifacts. Uh, so uh, this is related to what are known as uh, an observing system of, of floats in the ocean called Argo floats going down to about 2,000 meters now uh, and the processing of those. And this relates to the previous observing system, which is related to expendable bathythermographs, which are instruments that are dropped over the side of, the, of a boat uh, with a little thin uh, wire attached to it. And they go down to about mostly about 400 meters and measure the upper part of the temperature in the upper part of the ocean. But they don't measure what depth they're at. And you have to assume how fast these instruments are falling in the ocean. And then, of course, it depends upon the exact design in the instrument, how streamlined they are, and it, and it differs a little bit from one manufacturer to another. These were done mainly for uh, purposes other than for dealing with climate change, for climate. And uh, it's now been realized by careful comparisons with, of these so-called XBTs with the uh, very careful research-based observations, uh, so-called CTDs, that, uh, that there are errors in the so-called drop rate that have to be corrected for. And so this record uh, has now been thrown out. Uh, all of the papers that have been written about changes in ocean heat content and related things prior to about 2004 uh, or even prior to about 2007 have now largely uh, now are now largely incorrect in some form or another, and so there's been uh, some reprocessing of this by three different groups here uh, that are presented on this particular figure here. Uh, notice the big hump in here is now gone; it's more uniform increase. And I put some slopes on here as to how rapid the warming is. So this would be 0.8 watts per meter squared, which is sort of what we've got in here, and then you'll notice. Uh, I've shaded also in green on the right, showing some discrepancies here, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And also 0.3 watts per meter squared, which is sort of the slope over the longer term overall. Remember, we're looking at the for the for the time uh, in in uh, since 2000. We're estimating this is a, supposed to be about 0.9 watts per meter squared. We're looking for somewhere. Now this is a a slightly more up-to-date version from a whole bunch of different groups around the world that have uh, processed this. And um, if you look, go far enough back in the room, you'll say, well, these all look about the same. But then you look at them closely and you'll see, oh, there's quite a large number of differences among these that are a bit disturbing. So what is really going on here? Um, in general, I would characterize this as saying not much is happening uh, through here and then it, it kicks off and there's a warming trend. And then several of these records indicate that there's been a slowing of the increase in upper ocean heat content in recent times after about 2004. This uh, article by Lyman et al. appeared in Nature. And what they did was to take all of the ways in which the, these records have been processed and corrected and the assumptions that uh, were used and they applied them to a single data set. And they found that they could get all of these different range of variables. Uh, and what they did was to pr produce a, a curve, the black curve on here with error bars on it, which is their overall estimate from all of these. I think they should have been a bit more critical and said, well, some of these are actually not the right way to do these. The, all of these can't be equally right in, in doing these. And so this is still an evolving process as to how best to analyze these data and this relates to the, uh, the corrections, how you fill in gaps between observations, spatial gaps, uh, what you're assuming in, in, in those gaps, and, and, uh, uh, and how those gaps are changing over time. So I'll come back to this in a minute. There's been another uh, paper that was published by von Schuchman et al. in 2009, where they have used only the Argo data set going down to 2,000 meters so this is 0 to 2,000 meters. And uh, this is their overall record of the upper ocean heat content. And they uh, find that there's an increase in, in heat content of 0.77 watts per meter squared. But that applies to the ocean only. So when you multiply by 0.7 to account for the fact that the ocean is only 
70% of the globe, it comes to 0.54 watts per meter squared on a global basis. So it's still uh, short of our 0.9. Uh, this is the freshwater component. This is the uh, sea level and so-called the, the thermosteric component of the ocean heat content that they deduce. And, uh, uh, and you'll notice... Um, There's, a, there's, a, there's some differences between these. Now, notice the error bars are constant on this, but the, the, uh, the sampling is not as far from constant. In that particular study, this is what they show in terms of the changes compared with the World Ocean Atlas from 2005. So all of the compilation of the earlier data uh, going down to 2,000 meters. And a lot of the analysis that's occurred in recent times goes down to 700 meters depth, which is that level there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's a lot of XBTs information which you can get down to about that depth. So you'll see the main warming that this is showing is occurring here, and that's actually in the North Atlantic in particular, going penetrating quite, de quite deep. Uh, it's certainly more in the Northern Hemisphere but you'll see that this color here uh, is warming throughout much of the ocean. And there's a tremendous amount of mass in that ocean. So even a very small amount of warming, even if it's only uh, less than a tenth of a degree Celsius, turns out to be an enormous amount of heat. Uh, on the top here, there's the sea surface temperature change in red and the overall uh, change in the op uh, vertically integrated upper ocean heat content in blue here. And so the profiles of those are slightly different. So I have some comments here on this particular study. Uh, they didn't provide for comparison with other studies the 0 to 700 value. Uh, and, um, and yet a number of floats are programmed to go only to 1,000 meters. And so the sampling between 1,000 meters and 2,000 meters is quite different over time, uh, and yet all the error bars are the same. Um, and, and this doesn't make sense either because the coverage is actually increasing. And there are also questions about uh, the, the lifetime of these floats is supposed to be four years or something like that, and they, they hope to get even longer lifetimes out of these floats. Um, uh, these these uh, Argo floats are, are dropped over the side of a ship. They they, uh, list, they they live at about 2,000 meters depth, and then there's a little pump inside the, the float that uh, changes the, um, the the density of the float by pumping the water out of it and uh, and and creating um, an air bubble so that the thing floats to the surface. When it gets to the surface, as it's going to the surface, it takes a, a, a sensing of all of the temperature and salinity. It radio radios those back to satellite and gives a measurement at that location and then it go, uh, fills up the chamber and it goes back down again and it does this on a cycle of about every seven or ten days or something like that. And then it just drifts with the current at 2,000 meters depth so it does a sample at a different place over time. And so, um, so the, the sampling is, is changing over time. It's quite a remarkable uh, device uh, but uh, how you process that data is, is still uh, evidently not quite a solved problem. So this is the uh, estimate that we put together uh, as a combination of these things. This is a cleaned up version of the Lyman et al. Uh, uh, curve with the error bars on it and the overall slope, which is 0.64 watts per meter squared for, uh, for this period of time after 1993. And then this is the slope from... Uh, the von Schuchman et al. For the, for the period of the Argo data, which starts in about 2004 through here, which is this 0.54 watt per meter squared. And so there's this slowing down in these recent years after 2004. And in fact, if you were to put a slope on, on just the first part of this record, it would be you know, closer to what 0.7 watts per meter squared or 0.75 watts per meter squared, which is pretty close to what we estimate the radiative imbalance at the top of the atmosphere probably was for that period. Now I want to comment on uh, ocean fresh water or the, or the ocean salinity budget. Um, th these are kinds of questions that exist with coming out of the IPCC report. You know, 
uh, there's, there's a key question is, is how much of the melting ice is actually missed? Uh, is, is Greenland and Antarctic uh, melt a transient, in other words, a short-term phenomena, or is it going to continue? Uh, many glaciers are actually not monitored. Uh, the, the ocean warming can change the basal melting of uh, ice shelves, and this is poorly known. Uh, and these uh, ice shelves often uh, buttress the ice sheets and, and glaciers that are flowing into them off of Greenland and Antarctica and so on, uh, and they're very poorly modeled. Uh, and so there is concern that future sea level rise has been underestimated by uh, the IPCC in particular and a number of studies in the past. And so there's a lot of work going on in this area now. But uh, the key thing about melting ice, of course, is that it changes the salinity of the ocean and it affects the ocean currents. So uh, you had a lecture on this a year, a, a week ago, about melting of uh, Arctic sea ice from IPCC. And then these three values are the values since then. Of course, 2007 is the record low. Although in terms of volume, 2000 and, uh, 2010 may actually be the lowest volume on record. Um, so there's a, a, a brief comment there that we can do the sums uh, to say how much uh, energy does it re is required to melt this ice. And we've, we've done those sums on a global basis. And it turns out since 2004, it's actually quite small. It's only 0.02 watts per meter squared on a global basis. Now, partly that's because this is only a very small, a few percent of the globe in terms of area. Uh, but it's also the fact that to melt ice, it, it turns out it doesn't take that much energy. So we have estimates of the overall hydrological cycle, how much evaporation there is, how much is transported onto land, uh, the overall precipitation on land, and then the river flow and, and so on back uh, into the ocean. And combined with that river flow into the ocean, we can look at estimates of evaporation and precipitation. Uh, and this is a slightly old estimate now, but it's, a reasonably, it's still reasonably good, showing the, the patterns on the background here. So these are regions where evaporation exceeds uh, precipitation. These are regions where it doesn't rain very much in the subtropical high pressure systems over the ocean. And there's a lot of evaporation goes, and that feeds uh, the weather systems both at high latitudes and also in low latitudes. And this region here, this is the intertropical convergence zone and the South Pacific convergence zone. And, uh, and, and so these are the systems where there's a lot of precipitation and then there's a lot of precipitation in the storm tracks at higher latitudes. And those are regions where generally the precipitation exceeds evaporation. And so there are changes in salinity that are occurring. And I've put some overall numbers for uh, very broad regions here showing that you know, this region here, uh, there's generally an, an excess of evaporation over precipitation, even though this region is more. In this region, it's in the other direction, and here. In the Atlantic, in general, it's much more uh, of an evaporative ocean, and so things are always getting saltier here. Now, that's partly compensated for the fact that there's the Mississippi and the Amazon are producing fresh water into that region, so the runoff is very important. Uh, feeding uh, fresh water into these regions locally, but it also means that we can do the sums from how much is run off into the ocean and how much is uh, the salinity is changing because of the uh, imbalance between E and P on a global basis, and what that implies in terms of ocean heat, uh, ocean fresh water transports within the ocean. And so this is an estimate we made a little while ago now, which we're we're trying to update. Uh, there's a sort of a measured value through here. Uh, given that measured value and estimating what's happened over the Arctic, uh, we get these values here. And so there's a southward transport of fresh water throughout the Atlantic Ocean. There's a northward transport in here. There's a component which goes around Australia, which is labeled some unknown amount, FP, that sort of goes around here. And there's an extra amount which goes all the way around Antarctica, called FA, which is the amount that's going through here. And otherwise, uh, you can see that there is a, a flow of fresh water, or if you like to think of it a different way, a flow of more saline water that has to occur to offset these imbalances. And uh, 
there are changes in time that have occurred. Uh, this is the this is a pattern of, of e minus p again. Uh, well, this is the mean salinity. So this is e minus p, and then these are the changes that are occurring over the last 50 years. And it looks a little bit like this. And so regions that were already um, saline are getting more saline, and regions which were already um, fresher are getting fresher still. And this relates what is called the, the the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. So the regions which are already wet are getting wetter, and the regions which are already dry are getting drier. And so that relates to, uh, indeed, uh, changes in global warming uh, and the effects on the hydrological cycle. Uh, these are the, I'm not going to dwell on this, these are the changes by basin and the changes in the structure uh, uh, as a function of depth. But given the time, I'm going to speed through that and uh, talk briefly about sea level. This is the sea level record. Uh, the rates of there have been rates of uh, change, but you know back in here there's not that many observations, so there's a lot more uncertainty through here. And then in the recent record, the rates of increase are a little bit higher, something like three millimeters per year. And and so for the period after 1992, when we've actually had global measurements of sea level rise, the record looks like this. The slope here is 3.3 uh, millimeters per year. It's a bit more during El Nino, and it's a bit less during La Nina periods. And then we come to this question about, well, what, what's happened in this period when the overall heat content uptake by the ocean has been less after 2004? And this is a time, this is the global temperature here. This is also something which uh, there's been a, a lot in the newspapers about, well, where's global warming gone? It's not, the temperatures are not uh, increasing. Now, of course, 2010 is, is up uh, higher than this value here. So it's up here somewhere. Um, and so the last year uh, has been warmer than this. But uh, this is one of the things which has been played up by uh, climate skeptics. And so where has uh, global warming gone? So we wrote a paper where we, we looked at this in, in great detail. This is sort of the background. The surf, mean surface temperature, these are 12 months running means with an overall smooth value through it, shows the, the warm year, 1997-98, the big El Nino year, and then not much change in this period through here. But carbon dioxide is steadily going up and sea level is steadily going up. So what's going on with regard to the surface temperatures? And what about the energy? And so we, we've looked hard at the uh, energy at the top of the atmosphere. We've had measurements only from 2000 on, or March of 2000 on, and that's the black curve on here. These are measurements at the top of the atmosphere as to the energy imbalance that's occurring. And then this is how much is being taken up by the ocean in the blue. And the red is, is what happens if you add in all the contributions from melting ice and so on. And you'll see that it's a little bit fatter here than it was over there. But most of it is, is going into the ocean. And then after this time here, there's a big discrepancy. And so it's been referred to as, as the missing energy. So where's this energy going? And this related to one of my emails that was in the climate gate the debacle uh, where I was saying, you know, where is the missing energy? We can't balance the energy budget. The observing system isn't good enough. And it was picked up by skeptics and interpreters saying there's no global warming which is not what I said at all. Um, and so, for 1993 to 2003, we have this balance. Uh, the total energy and, uh, and how much has gone into the ocean and the other components, and these all add up reasonably well. But then when we look at 2004 to 2008, um, there is a contribution from the fact that the sun has gone quieter into a quiet phase, and that makes up about 10 to 15 percent of the overall value. But the ocean heat content has not increased as much as we as much as we thought it should have. And this is how much we think it should have. And so this part here is the part that we can account for in this in this period 2004 to 2008. Now, what we have done at NCAR is to look at our climate model. Uh, running it into the future, this is the model which will be run uh, used for IPCC in, in 2013. 
And here there are five different runs with this model. And I've highlighted uh, some segments from the blue run here uh, where there are periods in the future where there's no increase in temperature. Now, this is with increasing carbon dioxide over time. And it's what is referred to as the RCP 4.5. In other words, carbon dioxide keeps increasing to a point where somewhere after about 2050, it begins to level off and it stabilizes with a radiator forcing of, of 4.5 watts per meter squared. And so things are stabilizing toward the end of the century in, in these runs. For this purpose, it doesn't matter too much about what the details are, but um, those, those numbers there are the, um, uh, these are surface temperature numbers. So these are, the, these are, these are all surface temperatures in, in these runs. I'm, so I'm, I'm, that's what this label here says. So these are, so two, subtract 273 and you get, um, what, 15.5 degrees or something like that in these, in these uh, runs, uh, increasing over time. So this is what the model is suggesting. But even, and so warming is occurring in these models. And it's in fact the imbalance at the top of the atmosphere is of the order of one watt per meter squared throughout all of these runs. But there are periods of time of order a decade or so when there is no warming going on. And in this particular run, we've highlighted this. This is the blue run, the, this number one run, the dark blue run on here. This is the actual rates of change of decadal averages of surface temperature. And so there's a couple of periods here where it actually dips below zero. And you can see on here, part of it's related to noise. You're starting off at a high value and you're ending up with a low value. And so some of it relates to El Nino, La Nina stuff. Um, there's an example here also. And we've looked at some of these kinds of periods of order a decade to see what's going on. Because when we uh, look at it in, in full depth, this is what the ocean heat content looks like. If you go to the bottom of the ocean, the ocean heat content keeps going up steadily. If you look at the top 275 meters, during these periods, it levels off. And it levels off entirely. And the ocean is not warming in the upper ocean. In, in from 0 to 700 meters, it is warming somewhat um, in here. And so from here, you can see that the heat is going into the deeper ocean. And so we can look at that in, in more detail. Uh, this is actually what the... Uh, radiator foam balance at the top of the atmosphere is during this particular period here, and it's about one watt per meter squared. So there's energy coming into the, into the system. The uh, temperature is running along here about one degree C um, above the overall average. And then this is what's happened during these periods for these particular layers. The heat content between 275 meters has actually decreased above, below 700 meters, there's been uh, a substantial increase. And uh, below 275 meters is uh, showing where most of the increases occur. Now, all of, nearly all of the analyses that have been done of upper ocean heat content only go down to 700 meters with the one exception of the, of the von Schuchman et al. paper that I showed you. And, uh, and so the suggestion is that a lot of the ocean is not being adequately monitored at the current time, and that this is not a problem with the measurements at the top of the atmosphere, but rather it's a problem with how we can account for what's going on within the ocean. So there's these, these kind of questions here relating to uh, the, the mechanisms for this. We're not quite sure what it is yet. We're still looking into it, but it does seem to relate to uh, events like La Nina's uh, and um, and, and perhaps I'll say a little bit more about that in, in the next slide. Um, so there's a commentary on this with regard to the model. Uh, it doesn't happen with all El Nino, La Nina sequences, and, uh, and we're trying to understand the differences among these. So what's happened in the last uh, couple of years, this is uh, the so-called Nino 3.4 index showing a substantial La Nina uh, in 2007-2008. Uh, January of 2008 is the coldest month on a global basis uh, this century so far. There was also some cold months uh, in December, January of this year uh, in, in Europe 
and, and also North America. Uh, but here's the uh, El Nino that occurred from May of 2009 to, to May of 2010. The El Nino. What did I say? And so his sea surface temperature as a function of longitude along the equator for two degrees north to two degrees south uh, looking at it as a function of time, here's this uh, El Nino fading to La Nina, relatively cool sea surface temperatures as much as 2 degrees C below normal. But this is the heat content below the surface. Uh, this is the upper ocean heat content, and I've forgotten off the top of my head what it is. I think maybe it's only the top 400 meters. And so you can see uh, things were very cool here, but during this La Nina, the heat builds up in the ocean below the surface. And this is what then gives rise to the next El Nino. And so things are getting ripe. This, El Ni this La Nina is already in decline. The latest month uh, is, uh, is not as cold as it has been. And uh, this is what it looks like as a profile below the surface from 0 to 300 meters and across the, well, the Indian Ocean into the Pacific and into the Atlantic. And so there's this big buildup of heat in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean in the far west and Pacific temperatures in that region are more than four degrees Celsius above normal. And this is actually slowly propagating across. Uh, it's warming in this part of the ocean right now. And by um, June of this year, the La Nina will be gone. Um, this is uh, also suggesting uh, that when it warms in the Pacific, there is a subsequent warming in the Indian Ocean, and we know that that's an atmospheric teleconnection uh, over this period of time. And, uh, and so the, the Indian Ocean and also the Atlantic Ocean, as it turns out, warm following the uh, Pacific Ocean warming, and that has led to some of the flooding in uh, Australia uh, in, in December, January, and also the flooding in uh, India, Pakistan, and China in uh, June and July of last year. I, in view of the time, I'm not going to deal with these. Um, I have a few slides on these, but this is not my area of expertise. And so I'm just going to close with this uh, slide here, uh, saying that there is a challenge to better determine the heat budget of the surface of the Earth on a continuing basis. Um, where is, the, where is the heat going? Where does it come back to, to haunt us uh, later on? Some of these aspects uh, should be predictable and uh, should lead to some predictability. Uh, the ability to predict uh, sort of general trends on a, on a decadal time scale. And uh, we, we have atmospheric models that given what has happened in terms of the changes in the sea temperatures, we can actually predict uh, the... Uh, or, or hindcast, should we say, the uh, African drought, for instance, in the Sahel and the Dust Bowl in, in North America in the 1930s, given the global sea surface temperatures. And so the challenge is to predict these and predict the difference between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean in terms of how they respond to global warming, to the, to the changes in, uh, in the uh, energy that's coming in and how El Nino and the thermohaline circulation move that heat around and redistribute it. Um, and my comment is that so far we can't do this, but, but there's hope that they will improve. And uh, having a, a good observing system is also a key part of that. And uh, this is an Argo float. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I ran a little long. Hi. I was interested that you attributed the fl fluctuations in temperature in your CCSM4 model simulation to El Nino Southern Oscillation oscillations within the model. And, I was, and based on what you're saying here, I wonder if you could comment on the ability of these models now to simulate El Nino and how, I, I mean, I assume there are some that are better than others, but could you comment a little bit on the state or their ability to do that? The, um, so, the, yes, the comment relates very much to the ability of models to simulate ENSO events, and it hasn't been very good. I don't think any of the models that were in the last IPCC report would be what I would call good 
it, it, that, in, in that. Um, the NCAR model now has uh, a very realistic looking ENSO sequence, but it has larger magnitude than is observed in nature. Uh, the analysis that we have done of, uh, let's see, see if I can find it here. There's a few slides that are hidden here, but I got one here. Um, this one here. What we what we have done is to look at these kinds of uh, events when when this uh, stasis occurs in the in the surface temperature, and we've done some composites of these, and this is what the pattern of, of sea surface temperature looks like around the world, um, and where it's the significant, and so it, it turns out it relates very much to La Nina kind of patterns uh, in this particular model, um, and so during La Nina the Pacific is uh, relatively cloud-free, the sun is beating down, the heat goes into the ocean, it builds up in the western Pacific, which is what I sort of showed in the observations, and it gets uh, buried sort of at depth. But it turns out it's not just equatorial. In fact, we've, uh, in our analysis of this, in terms of the ocean heat content, the preliminary findings are that most of the heat is getting buried in the subtropics, uh, or up to about 40 degrees latitude and it's off equatorial, which is where we don't have such a good observing system. And so I think, and it's mainly in the Pacific. It's not the Atlantic and it's not the Indian Ocean. It's more in the Pacific. And so uh, if the model is anything like right, uh, it suggests where we should start looking harder at the observations. And we've got a project to indeed try to do that using the Argo data. We just wish the oceanographers could get the Argo data so that it looks the same from one group to another to another. At the moment, if you look at six or eight different analyses, you get eight different answers. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's still a part of the challenge in, in terms of the observations. So there's a, you know, a challenge in, in terms of observing the system better, but there's also a challenge in modeling the system better. And I hope, there, I think there will be a project in the next IPCC report specifically to look at performance of models with regard to things like El Nino. So is there evidence that there's a trend towards slowing of the thermal haline circulation? Not that I'm aware of. The noise, the variability is the main thing that's being emphasized at the moment. Uh, there is certainly a suggestion that it may uh, slow as you go into the future. Uh, this does relate uh, not only to the thermodynamic component, which has been the main thing that's been talked about, so warming at high latitudes uh, can potentially do that, but it also relates very much to what happens with regard to E minus P, the uh, this changes in salinity that also affect the density, and that varies quite a bit from one model to another, it turns out. Um, so I don't believe the observational evidence because the variability is so large, is sufficient to indicate one way or the other at the moment. On this curve, the the missing energy is there is no missing energy. You you have put it all in the in the deep ocean. In right. the deep ocean, that's correct, and that's based strictly on energy. You don't have a mechanism. Um, for transfer for transporting heat to the deep ocean, there, the, you know, there, there uh, I, I didn't know how much to go into it with the group that was here, but the there are uh, subtropical overturning circulations uh, in the Pacific that clearly play a substantial role in uh, moving heat around. Although the main thought is that they're mainly have been mainly involved in the top of what 400 meters of the ocean or something like that. And, uh, and so there is some overturning that occurs in both hemispheres uh, that is clearly important, uh, largely involving the, the tropics to the subtropics, these subtropical overturning circulations. But the other part of it that I think needs to be explored a lot more and where there is potential for uh, depositing heat at much greater depths is in the western part of the Pacific and in particular in association with the boundary currents. So the East Australian current and the Kuroshio current. 
And there, uh, there are clearly components that go down below a thousand meters. And, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of variability. Those are the most dynamic features in the ocean. The, uh, the currents can, uh, can be, you know, a meter per second. Uh, same thing with the Gulf Stream. And, and so it's in, in those regions also where I think we need to look harder as well. But putting it on the scale on it, the ocean is uh, six kilometers deep at the, that point. So we, do, we just don't know about, those, about the convection we, in We don't region. know well what is going on. There, you know, the sampling of the deep ocean is quite fragmentary. There are a couple of papers. Uh, the main authors are Greg and Johnson from uh, and um, um, there's an author, what is it, Purcell? Or P, it begins with P and Johnson, um, who, have, who have done an analysis of the data that do exist. Uh, Sarah Gilley has also looked at this over the southern oceans, uh, suggesting indeed that there's evidence of warming at, at greater depths, uh, generally permeating through. And, uh, you know, the, the oceanographers are not quite sure how this happens. Uh, you know, I think there's still, you know, the, the general thought is that the, the abyss, the, the deep part of the ocean is relatively, uh, there's not much action there and things change very slowly. And, and, and if, it's, if it's just through uh, uh, conduction rather than through currents moving things around or convection moving stuff around, then it's, it should be a very slow process. There, there are uh, things like uh, tides, tides which are continually pumping the ocean up and down and, and in some places at greater depths are known to cause mixing, which is probably important. That may not be fully taken into account. And so it may be that there are ways and places where, where heat is mixed down more readily than others, but it, it may not be everywhere. Uh, and... Um, and some seasonality can come into play. Uh, that's certainly the case in, in the North Atlantic, for instance. I mean, the main convection that occurs in the ocean is when you get in winter the cold, dry outbreaks and there's large heat fluxes into the atmosphere that cools the surface of the ocean and then that cool water sinks and so there's overturning within the ocean and so in wintertime you can uh, make uh, very large uh, changes to, to uh, a few kilometers depth. Uh, in association with those kind of events, uh, and there can be better connectivity. But in general, you know, especially with a warming uh, climate, if you're warming the surface, it's more buoyant and, and it tends to sit there, and the ocean becomes more stable, which has some ramifications, of course, for marine ecosystems as well. Um. And sorry, just in essence of time, uh, we actually have the opportunity to move to another room for those of you who want to have a more extended conversation uh, into the Ermax boardroom, I believe. Uh, and I also wanted to make another quick announcement that at 4.30 this afternoon, uh, Dr. Trenberth has offered to give us a bit of a, um, an overview of his recent trip to Christchurch post-earthquake. Uh, I was in the earthquake. <laughs> oh, didn't I was that passed part. over <laughs> in the earthquake, yes. Well, you get a first-hand account. It's a very personal interested. account. Um, so there's, uh, there's some time now in the boardroom to have a more informal chat uh, if, for those of you who are interested and come back at 4.30 if you have the opportunity. So let's thank Dr. Tenworth one more time.